Hey folks, welcome to Weiss Advice powered by BeatStars.com. This primer is going to be about compression, but before we jump into it, I've got to give a special shout out to Tuna Beats for providing the track that we are using for this demonstration. All right, let's get started. So what is compression? Well, compression, if we think of the word in the general sense, means squeezing something together. And in the audio sense, it literally means squeezing sound together. It means that we take the peak of the dynamic range of something and we push it down and get it closer to the bottom of the dynamic range, meaning we're making the loud stuff quieter, but we're keeping the quiet stuff where it's at. Think of it as like sort of squeezing a sponge or something like that. So how does it work? Why do we do it? Well, there's a number of reasons. The primary reason why we will reach for a compressor is if the dynamic range of something is totally all over the place. And what that means is, let's say we have a vocalist or some acoustic element where parts are performed very quietly and other parts are performed very loud. Well, through the course of a record, that might be a little bit disorienting for the end listener. We might want things to just be like a little bit more consistent. And so we would use a compressor to sort of help even out the range of the various parts. And that could apply to just words and phrases or even syllables within a vocal performance or just keeping the strums of an acoustic guitar in check or perhaps we're just trying to get a drum kit to kind of glue together a little bit. So there's a lot of practical reasons why we use them. There are also some effect kind of reasons that we use compressors. The compressor can also be used on a more microscopic scale to sort of shape a sound. And through that, we can enhance the punch of something, or we can make something feel fuller or have more fatness, something to give it a little bit more beef and body. And these are also very common applications. So it really depends on what we're doing and what our end goal is. So I'm going to play a little bit of this record and then I'm going to bring on a compressor that I've put on the master channel and you'll hear an example of how I've used a compressor to just sort of beef everything up a little bit. Here's the before. time. I'll turn it off and on as I play it. And you hear that when I turn the compressor on, everything seems to come forward and feel a little bit fuller. It almost feels a little bit louder, but if you're actually checking the meter, you'll see that the peak is really in the same place. And the reason why it's giving this impression of bigness and loudness is because all of the stuff that's below the peak is being turned up, meaning that there's more level and amplitude throughout the signal more consistently. All right, so let's start looking at some of the controls of a compressor. Here I've got the Fruity Compressor. Now don't let this GUI fool you. This is actually a very good compressor. I like it a lot. It's really transparent and it's very easy to control. The only thing that you might not like about it is that it's not going to give you a visual image. You're going to have to use your ears. This is a great way to train yourself on compression. If you are just starting out, I cannot recommend highly enough using the Fruity Compressor exclusively so that you can just force your ear to recognize what's really happening. Let's start with the primary control in a compressor, and that's the threshold. The threshold is setting a volume point. It's saying at a certain level of decibels, that's when the compressor is going to kick on. So we have a quiet signal that's building up, building up, building up. Maybe the vocalist is talking quietly or performing quietly. Then suddenly they get really loud. If we set that threshold above the quiet part, but below the loud part, that tells the compressor, leave the quiet stuff alone, but grab the loud stuff and start affecting that. In other words, the threshold is the inflection point. It's saying, okay, this is where we go. Now, what might be a little bit different or confusing is that the threshold does not go from zero and up. It actually goes from zero and down. This is because in the digital world, we have a ceiling and that's called zero dB and all of our level is actually falling below that. It's going down pretty far. This threshold will go down minus 60 decibels, and that's pretty much the quietest we're ever gonna have anything in our records. So it's more than enough room to work. But it actually goes from minus 60 in this particular threshold 
up to zero. Other compressors are going to have different ratings on how low they go, but they will all cap at the top, which is zero. Nothing in the digital world goes over zero dB without distorting. So when I'm setting my threshold, the way that I affect it is by turning the threshold down rather than turning it up. So I'm going to start playing this record and I'm going to start turning this threshold down and it's going to start acting over more and more and more of the signal and you'll start hearing the compressor clamp down harder and harder. You hear how as I start pulling the threshold down past a certain point, we're basically just turning the volume down, although the kick seems to be staying a little bit louder, a little more pervasive. And we're going to talk about that in a second, but basically this is setting an amplitude point, and that's going to tell the compressor, okay, here's where we start working. Our next control is going to be the ratio. The ratio is going to be how hard the compressor is going to work. Are we really going to clamp down on anything that's above the threshold, or are we just going to kind of pull the volume down a little bit? If something jumps way above the threshold, and we have the ratio way up, it's going to do a whole bunch of gain reduction. Whereas if I have the ratio down, it's really only going to turn the signal down ever so slightly, just to kind of gently even things. So the ratio, again, it depends on what we're doing. Do we want to really lock things in place, or do we want to just kind of gently even things out? Most of the time, when we're working with compression, depending on what we're going for, we're going to be working between ratios of about 2 to 1 to maybe 10 to 1 at the absolute most, and really very little above and below, although there are some applications. So I'm going to turn this ratio all the way up and I'm going to start adjusting the threshold and we're going to see how it acts very much like a level control. Now I'm going to start turning the ratio down and you're going to hear the level of our master track start coming back. And as I get to one to one, that's where no gain reduction is being applied at all. Now, the next two controls in the compressor are really the ones that people tend to get tripped up on over the most, and this is because this is where compressors are a little different than EQs. EQs, you kind of act independently. Each band is sort of doing its own thing, but with compressors, everything is sort of interlocked and interdependent in terms of the end results that we're going to get, and that's because compressors are very much dependent on time. So if we set our attack and release controls differently, we're going to get a wildly different arrangement of compression effects. Okay, so what are attack and release controls? They are the timing constants in which gain reduction is applied to a signal. In other words, let's say we're going to be pulling the signal down with a certain amount of force. There is also the question of how fast are we going to apply that force. You can almost think of it as like a level fader. Think of it as like a, a, a programmed robotic engineer with their hand on a level fader. Once they hear a level peak too much, the compressor is going to start turning it down. That robot could either go like that, where it pulls down the level very fast, or it could go like this, where it pulls down the level very slowly. And those are going to have two very different effects. One is going to simply clamp down on anything that's involved. The other is going to allow some of the punch of an element to get through without being affected as greatly. Now, when I did these examples, you heard that the kick drum didn't feel like it was being turned down quite as much as the rest of the record. That's because my attack time is set to 73 milliseconds, which is a little bit on the slower side, at least in terms of drums. This is allowing a lot of the punch of the kick to get through without being reduced as much as the rest of the level. So what I'm going to do here is turn my threshold back up, turn my ratio pretty high, and I'm going to change the attack time. I'm going to start by putting the attack really slow and you're going to hear the kick drum come through pretty dramatically.
proportionate to the rest of the record, we hear a lot of kick drum now, right? Now, watch what happens if I do the same thing at the same threshold, but I turn the attack down to zero milliseconds. Now we don't hear the kick come through very much, right? Everything's sort of been flattened and pancaked off. So when we have very fast attack times, it's going to grab that punch. And sometimes that's a good thing. We don't necessarily want every element in our mix to be super punchy. Sometimes we need things to kind of just play the background. Sometimes we need things to not spike forward. Sometimes we need to just shape the attack of a drum, just the very, very little bit of it, just to kind of rein it into place. So fast attack times certainly have their place. More often than not, we're going to be looking at medium to slower attack times because that's going to preserve the healthy transients of an element. It's going to allow things to punch through and give us that impact that we really want. Now the release is functionally the same concept except for it works in the other direction. Not only is there a speed in which our robot is turning a fader down, but there's also the speed in which the robot is going to turn that fader back up to where it originally belonged. And again, that could be very fast, or it could be more gradual. And that's going to dictate how the compressor lets go and what the action is. We can get a lot of very, very interesting things when we start messing around with our release times. Now, most of the time, there's going to be a sweet spot for the release around 200 milliseconds, or maybe a little less, where things feel fairly natural. Most compressors will function in this way, although there are definitely some exceptions. So when I do that, if I set my attack time to say 30 milliseconds, and I set my threshold to say minus 30 here on this record. We're really just hearing a very compressed version of this record, but there isn't too much uh, artifact from the dynamic interchange. There isn't too much weirdness being produced by the compressor itself. Now that's going to change if I start going into very fast or very slow release times. If I go to very fast release times, I'm going to turn up some gain here so we can hear better. Can you hear how there's a bit of a crunchy texture that's shown up and the bass actually feels like it's kind of wobbling a little bit? This is called intermodulation distortion, and this is what happens when our release time is just too fast. It's actually happening so quickly that compression is being done within the waveform itself, and it's distorting the wave shapes and creating harmonic distortion. It's actually kind of a fun and neat effect to play with as a special effect, but over an entire record, it kind of sounds not so good. Now, let's go the other direction. Let's see what happens if we put a very, very long release time into play. We can feel this tension over the entire record. It's this sort of means in which the compressor never really lets go, and so we end up kind of just changing the level sort of semi-permanently. We're not really getting enough of that restoration, and so the compressor is just acting more like a level control, and that's not really that good either. Now, there are times where a longer release is going to work really well. Certain things that tend to be longer in terms of their envelope in general, this is okay. So, for example, a bowed upright bass. If we were trying Trying to control the levels, we would probably want a very slow release like this, and we'd also probably want a slightly slower attack as well. But when it comes to things that have lots of drums that are playing within certain intervals, a one millisecond release time, if we think about how much that takes, I mean, we're talking about an entire bar of music at this point, and that's probably not what we're going for. There are, of course, other little things that can happen in between our sort of medium sweet spot and when we start getting toward the faster side versus finding something that's more natural. If we have, say, something like a 30 millisecond release, we might not hear a lot of distortion. But 
But do you notice how there's this sort of moment where we hear this sort of burst of energy, so to speak? Watch what happens if I bypass this. Now I'm going to bring it back in. Do you hear how there's this almost like grabbing and letting go quality, this kind of boom, bam? boom, bump, like there's like an extra added dynamic to the record. It's a little weird, but listen for it. Listen to that doom, bump. That's going to come out in a really interesting way. With it. You hear how there's that sort of exaggerated kind of a movement in it? This is called pumping or sometimes called breathing, and it's where the compressor is acting heavily enough and over a fast enough release that the internal dynamics of the sound are getting exaggerated. Now, here's the fun thing. Sometimes this effect can actually be really cool. Right now, it sort of has a sea sickening effect because it's being done so dramatically. But if I were to turn the ratio down to make the compressor act a little less aggressively, That little extra bit of dynamic that we're getting kind of actually sounds good. It's giving us just a little bit of extra emphasis on that certain upswing up note, and I like that for this record. So sometimes the artifacts and things that we try to generally avoid can actually be nice, and we have to use our artistic discretion and our producer mindset to determine when something is bad bad versus when it's good bad, so to speak. All right, there's one other really important control, and it's a little bit more nuanced than some of the other ones that we're talking about, and that is the knee control. Now, this here is called type in this particular compressor, but this type is really affecting what's called the knee of the compressor. And in other compressors, most of the time, it's going to be labeled knee, and we're going to have these various settings, a hard knee, a medium knee, a soft knee, and this one has vintage, which I am assuming is probably emulating a specific kind of optical knee, which I'll explain a little bit in a moment, but to say that it is a more unique character of a knee. In order to gain a visual representation of what the knee is doing, I've pulled up a third-party plugin. It's the FabFilter Pro C2. It's got a great graph that can show visually exactly what a knee control does. So here I have the knee selector pulled up and I have it set to hard knee. You'll notice that right here at this crosshairs is an inflection point. That's where the compressor is acting. If this is based on the vertical signal of our amplitude, our level going up, once we hit this point, that's when the compressor starts in and now gain reduction is being applied. However, let's say I take the knee and I start to soften it. Now we see what's happening is that it no longer looks like an angle, but it starts to look like a curve. And what's more important is that below, we actually start to see this quadrant right here become affected. The amplitude starts going down as I start increasing the knee. By increasing the curvature, what we're really telling the compressor is that as the signal approaches the threshold, some gain reduction starts getting applied, and the closer we get to the threshold, the more gain reduction is getting applied, meaning that the actual compression action is starting at a slightly lower level than where our actual inflection point is. And you might be thinking, well, why would you ever want to do that? The main reason is transparency. If the gain reduction starts getting applied a little bit earlier and a little more gently than what we've set our compressor to, then it becomes more gradual at the onset and the overall sound is a little bit more transparent and a little bit more natural. It feels a little bit more like that's the way it was performed. And there are good reasons and bad reasons to do this. On things that have very, very sharp, fast envelopes like kick drums, snare drums, hi-hats, a lot of the times we want to have a hard knee compressor because we're really affecting only the 
the fastest moments of the sound. However, on something that's more gentle in its delivery and approach, something like vocals or an upright bass or a bass guitar, we might want to have a little bit of a softer knee so that the use of the compression is a little bit more transparent. And when it's a little bit more transparent, if we want to make something big, we can use a little bit more compression and get away with it without it being a little bit intrusive to the listener's ear. Now, not all knees are perfect curves. Our hard knee is going to be an angle, our medium knee is going to be a slight curve, our soft knee is going to be a pretty gradual and dramatic curve, but this vintage setting is probably emulating a very specific curve that might have a little bit of a kink to its shape, something that looks maybe more like an S or maybe has a changing angle as it approaches. It's probably emulating something like an LA-2A that has a very unique shape to it. All you really need to know is how it sounds at the end of the day. Don't get caught up in the minutia of these things. You know, reading the manual, never a bad idea, but ultimately what we listen for is the change in the sound. So let's play with this knee control. The vintage one does something very interesting, but before we look at that one more time, let's just jump between hard knee and soft knee. Can you hear that in the hard knee setting, Everything that isn't being affected by the compressor feels like it's in the same place and that we're really only affecting the things that are loud versus when we use the soft knee, it almost feels like the compression is acting over every bit of the signal, but at different amounts. Let's listen one more time. The soft knee puts almost a haze over the entire record, which makes it pretty inappropriate for what we're doing. Now, let's go over to this vintage knee. I love how the release feel is coming through on this vintage knee. Let's go from hard knee to vintage. Notice how the bass just has a very consistent drone here. There's not really any bowing or change of amplitude to the bass, it just kind of feels streamlined in this hard knee. Now listen to the vintage knee. Do you hear how there's almost a rise in the sound between the kick drum and the snap? And I feel like I hear it most in the bass. There's almost this slight ramping up quality, like a pulling sort of thing. It's almost like a taffy kind of sensation. And I really like that. I think that that creates a really nice dynamic and a really nice feel. And that's ultimately what we're going for when we look at all of these numbers with attack times and release times and ratios and thresholds. And it, you know, it looks like we're doing an algebra equation, but in reality, what we're doing is we're affecting the push and the pull between the elements and the overall consistency of everything. And those are musical ideas. So I like this vintage setting for what we're doing here. Of course, the hard setting could be tweaked to work. Really, any of these settings could be tweaked to work in different ways, it ultimately just comes down to what we are trying to do.